So, um, from a scientific perspective, you know, system is often seen as um, when we are looking at if the elements within a system are interconnected and interdependent, then we'd say that it's a system. Very practical example that I usually give my kids is to say if I take a bucket with blocks of Lego, um, do I have a system? Yeah? And then the question is what happens if I take one block away from that bucket? Will it fall apart? So if I take one block away and there's no structural disruption, um, to the rest of the blocks, then we would say technically that's not a system. Now, for example, we're making with those Lego blocks a, a little wall, and now we're taking one block away. What happens then? Does the wall collapse now? If the answer is yes, then that means that we have established that there are interdependencies and interconnections. If we're taking now, for example, the body as a living system, and can I just take an organ away? Yeah, there are, you can, but there are major implications, yes? From that deeper philosophical perspective, we could also say that life itself is a living system and that the nature of life is that at a deeper level it is unified and that the reality of life is its interdependence and is its interconnectedness. And once we have that kind of you know, deeper understanding, this is when you go into the heart, <laughs> and you said the heart of systems change, yes? Um, is to go to that place where um, in order to have a sense of the system dynamics, you can no longer keep that dualistic perspective of me versus you and us being different. Then we start to really uh, you know, see the, the living complexity and that's the journey of into the heart of systems change. system is interconnected, interdependent. So every system, because it is whole, and it is a unique expression of that wholeness that we are, it has a systemic integrity. Now what it means is that one that system starts to grow and it starts to evolve and it starts to also diversify and it becomes more complex, and this is actually a universal principle itself, then we will start to see that at every stage of new growth and new development, there are certain boundaries. And the boundaries is really the feedback system of the system itself to say, well, hold on, you know, if I'm going to stretch a little bit more here, I'm going to grow more complex or more diversified, but the rest of me can't catch up, then I might collapse. Yeah? So the systemic boundaries is really the intelligence, the wisdom of the system, that allows it to come from its potentiality all the way into the full actualization. Evolutionary coherence now means that when it diversifies, it's like you were these little cells before and now you are this amazing complex being and you start to see that inside and there's a whole lot of diversification of all the different cells and, and neural networks. But somehow your system in that diversity, it stays in tune with itself. So it's like it's harmonic. It has the capacity to adapt, to learn, um, to fine tune, just like you would have like a beautiful symphony. So what we start to see is that evolutionary coherence of a system, the, the you know, systemic capacity to stay in tune with itself through its changes, through its developments, is absolutely important. But what we are seeing in these kind of mechanistic systems, the human-made systems, is that we've developed a growth model that is always based on quantitative growth, not qualitative growth. So what we're doing is we want to just expand. Yeah? We think that growth means more of things rather than better quality or the deeper dimensions of growth. So what happens is through those growth impulses now, um, when we start to hit a system boundary, rather than learning from that system boundary and seeing, hey, the system is giving me feedback to say, slow down, rest, go within, make sure you regroup, make sure you don't lose the interconnectedness, listen. What we are seeing instead in our kind of Western models of 
exponential extractive growth is that the growth seeks to go in this way and when it finds this systemic boundary, it ignores it and it actually goes over the threshold. So rather than learning from it, it sees it as something we need to conquer it. You can see in a lot of the human-made systems is we completely ignore pain. Whereas the pain is actually, again, a way of the system saying, you know, be careful, warning here, listen, listen. And we are not sensitive to that pain. We, in fact, we kind of barge over that. So those systems are not aware of the signals and the information through pain. And so that growth pattern then starts to become a barrier. So if we want to know the difference between a systemic barrier or a systemic boundary, we can qualify that in the following way. If the behavior of a system starts to harm the interdependencies of the system, then it forms a barrier to itself and the systems it forms part of. And it's incredibly important to know the difference because if we're looking at our sustainability and thriveability crisis, and including in that our climate crisis, biodiversity loss and all the other problems, then what we're starting to see, it's actually a barrier issue. But we start treating it as if it's a boundary issue. We feel we have to manage the boundaries, the thresholds. But what we are not aware of is that it's by actually not honoring and including in our growth model the, the feedback and what we can learn from the boundaries that we create systems that create barriers to that process and that the consequences of systemic barriers is the climate crisis, the biodiversity loss, but also the human crisis, which means that we are now in systems where we're not listening to each other. We're creating artificial feedback loop systems. We are not developing compassion because we're shut down and we're not, we think that pain is something that we need to be afraid of or we need to ignore or we see it as vulnerability as a weakness. And also what happens is when there is no responsiveness to pain, the trust in a system goes down. Because people, when they feel like, well, even if I'm hurting and I'm saying, hello, I need help, there is no response for the system, or in fact the opposite, the bullying over that, the trust goes down. When the trust goes down, people are scared also to collaborate. And so when we then start to see trust going down, fear rising up, then you start to see that people don't want to collaborate or have fear of anticipation of collaboration. And when that happens, now the diversity that is in that system that before was evolutionary coherent, collaborating, co-learning, co-creating, now that diversity starts to fight. So it starts to become competitive, it starts to fight against itself, and that is just like a viral system, isn't it? But I'm also seeing a deep intelligence of our planet itself to heal herself, to regenerate herself, to restore herself. And so what I've noticed also in my own body, say that um, my, my hand gets injured, there's a whole intelligence of my body wisdom that comes towards that injured part yeah? and brings resources there and brings healing there. And so, when I think of our planet, I'm not only seeing her as injured. I'm not only seeing her as even as far as dying or, you know, suffering. Because if that's the only reality that I'm connecting with, oh gee, it's so hard from there to feel any kind of hope. You know, what I know is that in the, it's exactly in those areas where we are most vulnerable, where there has been this damage, where there's this been this pain that there is a resourcefulness that comes up towards those areas, and that is happening. So the health of a system, that intelligence is always there. Also, when it's highly polluted, intoxicated, suffering, and you may think it's already collapsed, that intelligence does not get lost. I really see this as an incredible invitation for all of us to bring forth resources within ourselves and within our togetherness that we never even knew were possible and for us together to become the possibility of an incredibly healthy system. 
The good news is that intelligence and that wisdom is given. It's really only for us now to work with it, to apply that. And as we apply that, we will discover and learn so much more. Because if you do not understand that deeper dimension that is always there, and you're only working at the level of where things have become a problem, and you're starting to course correct it, without realizing that you become part of the problem. It's holarchic, not hierarchic. It's collaborative, not competitive. It's unity and diversity, so there's no dichotomy between that. It is both quantitative and qualitative. So there is also an inner dimension of growth, which is rest, it's just integration. It remains holarchically nested. Um, it's responsive, not reactive. It's adaptive, it's resilient, it's dynamic and flexible, not static and rigid. It's evolutionary coherent, which is not cohesion. Cohesion is trying to keep things you know, together, cemented. It doesn't need to do that because it is in tune with itself. Then we can start to ask ourselves, what is the equivalent of that in practice? Systems that, we, that seek transformation or need transformation are systems that have become decoupled from that, that are no more sourced within that. And you know, previously we were approaching that almost like as if this deeper implicate order is out there, as if it's a spiritual dimension, and the material world is all here, and as if they are kind of two different worlds. Yeah? What we start to see now, that that's actually not true at all. That this deeper implicate order, it's not out there, it's, it's right here. So that what needs to transform is the information system that disconnects from that, that has become decoupled from that. Because the information and communication, therefore also systems, that are no more sourced in that implicate order, they create a reality of duality, they, get, they create experiences of division, they polarize people and systems, and they, they kind of disrupt how life would actually naturally evolve and emerge. So you start to create in those systems spaces, possibility spaces, evolutionary spaces, where life can come back. And then that intelligence starts to now guide and inform, create new experiences of what it means to be together. Now those new experiences that are very often much more, you know, fulfilling experiences, much more purposeful experiences, now become attractors. You start to nurture those attractors. Those attractors then start to also guide um, the next levels of behavior. So you start to see how you create this positive ripple effect. For me, thriveability is that deep innate ability within every living being, within every system, to bring forth its innate potentialities of its goodness, of its health, and to be able to initiate and participate in a process that is conducive to its evolutionary learning, its evolutionary development, and within which the health of itself is part of the larger health of the system. If I say the word to you, sustainability, and you were to have to draw that, how would that look like? Almost everybody was going with this flat line. <laughs> Nothing in life is a flat line. It's a different word, but in the word sustainability, to sustain, it's always like it looks like it's to maintain something. But when you, and I ask people now, visualize the word thrive. You know, express to me how that feels to thrive. And to have the ability to thrive, and what if that ability is given? It's innate there, but we do need to help strengthen and create the conditions for all of us to thrive. Then you get completely different imagery. If you don't have this flat line. There's also the dimension of joy in that, you know, which we um, don't have in a lot of those other words, you know, is that 
it's, it's not enough for me. It's not enough to say, let's focus on the minimum harm. It's, it's, it's really not enough. To me, it's like, what's the maximum goodness that we can create together, you know? Let's work from beauty. Okay, wonderful. So now that you've heard all this information, I would really like to see what are you going to do about that? How are you going to take this home? And how are you going to apply everything that you've learned? Now, you may have noticed in what we shared today is that collaboration is essential. So I want to ask you now to do a little evaluation. How collaborative really are you? And when tensions arise or when fears arise or when there are doubts, what are the triggers? So what are the moments, the kind of switch off points that you would let go of a collaborative attitude? And then what's required for you to come back into collaboration? So what I'm gonna ask you now to really put yourself through the test this week.